In December 1884, a young man traveled to Copenhagen. He'd been born to a poor family in the middle of Denmark, not far from the place on Funen, where the fairy tale writer Hans Christian Andersen had been born half a century before. The 18-year-old was called Carl August Nielsen, and he was to become his country's most important composer and musical personality. And now his dearest wish was coming true. After an audition, he'd been admitted to the Royal Academy of Music in Copenhagen on a scholarship. Three years later, he took his exam as a violinist. But the composer Niels W. Gaither was also one of his mentors at the Academy. The internationally famous Gaither was the absolute leading figure there. People simply called it Gaither's Academy. Four years later, in the Tivoli Concert Hall, Carl Nielsen's first mature work, The Little Suite for Strings, was performed for the first time. It was a great success, he said later, and the second movement, an interlude in waltz time, was encored. But the great Niels W. Gaither was certainly not enthusiastic. My dear Nielsen, he said, it's too messy. Carl Nielsen accepted Gaither's criticism and rewrote parts of the suite. His next work was a string quartet that he thought was better and weightier. But when it was called incomprehensible and more or less cut to pieces by the critics, he was less compliant. I had a good idea, he wrote later. I decided to go my own way. He soon realized that a young artist had to get out of the narrow Copenhagen cultural milieu to find new impulses. The so-called Ancheska Travel Grant was at that time a unique chance for young needy artists to experience the bigger European art scene. After several unsuccessful attempts, he finally succeeded in 1890 in getting the large grant which enabled him to spend almost a whole year in Germany, France, and Italy. At that time, ten years before the first gramophone reached Denmark, many major musical works that are widely known today were still quite rarely heard and almost unknown, even to musicians. In Dresden, for example, Carl Nielsen saw Richard Wagner's opera Das Rheingold, on the city's famous opera stage. And he noted in his diary, anyone who doesn't consider Wagner great is himself very small. In Berlin, the music of Johannes Brahms made a particularly strong impression on him. This journey was to become very significant for him. After five months in Germany, Karl Nielsen went in the spring of 1891 to Paris. 
There he met the great Danish painter J.F. Willemsen, who had just agreed to sit for a bust by a young Danish sculptress by the name of Anne-Marie Brodersen. In his diary, Carl Nielsen writes, in the evening to Victor Bendix, well, I had a good time. Miss Brodersen is actually very pretty. And a few days later, danced with Miss Brodersen at Montmartre and later at the Moulin Rouge. Saw a can-can with a famous, notorious girl and some men and also saw the so-called belly dance. Got to bed at half past two. A fortnight later, he writes, I can't remember what I have experienced today, except that in the evening, I found the woman for whom I have constantly felt the whole gamut of emotions. and we want to spend our life together and be happy. And nothing will make me doubt it anymore. I feel richer and more profound in her company. Together, the two young artists traveled to Italy. and marie got pregnant and in May, they were married in the English church in Florence. The honeymoon trip through the country where art and nature vied for their attention was a dream journey. In Rome, Bologna and Venice, they absorbed impressions from the whole history of European art. In this almost euphoric state, they suddenly discovered that the money was running out. They had to go home at the expense of the Danish consulate. Back in Copenhagen, they moved together into a little loft in Newham. Times were hard financially, although after his leave of absence, Carl Nielsen resumed his job as second violin in the Royal Danish Orchestra. A job he kept for 16 years, but never grew to like, since it got in the way of his creative work. Artistically, though, he had grand dreams. He'd begun in earnest on a work that had long been tumbling around in his brain. A symphony. In Germany, a performance of Beethoven's Fifth had made an intense impression on him. The concise, concentrated use of a very short motif overwhelmed him. And in his diary, he noted, one would think this work had fallen down from heaven. His own first symphony begins with a similar striking motif that experiments with both tonality and rhythm. And the first movement is very aptly headed, orgoglioso, the Italian word for proud. By then, young Anne-Marie Brodersen, who had now become Anne-Marie Carl Nielsen, was already a recognized, ambitious artist. And with her classically inspired sculptures, especially of animals, she was later to become one of the most important sculptors of her time. Her art was strongly influenced by the Renaissance masters, but her own personality came through clearly in solid, vital, naturalistic forms with narrative imagery that had scope for both the intimate and the monumental. A few years later, in the autumn of 1896, she wrote in a letter to her husband about a dream she had. We two were walking in a lovely green wood. We were talking and the sun was shining. 
But all the time, there were some tiresome people working in the ditches wherever we went. Many people have experienced how dreams can speak their own language. This dream clearly speaks of two people whose quiet togetherness is disturbed by something from the outside, by work, in fact. And in the marriage of the two artists, the work of creating art was again and again getting in the way of marital harmony. The demands of art and the demands of life are often difficult bedfellows, even when, as in this case, the two artists always stimulated each other's talent. They had very high ideals, both about the love they shared and about their shared responsibility for art. Unattainable ideals, it was to emerge. That autumn, Anne-Marie worked with animal sculptures in the provinces, while Carl had to attend to his duties in the Royal Orchestra and stay in Copenhagen with the rest of the family, two small daughters and their then just one-year-old son, Hans Boer. It surprises both me and everyone else that a mother can spend six to seven weeks away from a year-old child, he writes, accusing me to his wife. To hell with the rubbish we two can do when it is at the expense of our own and the children's happiness. Anne-Marie writes back, you know that I'll come just as soon as I can. And she does not give much for what she calls those stupid women who have nothing better to chatter about than agreeing with you that I should stay home and busy myself with you and the children. They take turns accusing each other of not taking an interest in each other's work and not taking enough care of the children. Although Carl had the greatest respect for his wife's work, he was in no doubt that her place was in the home. His view of her role was a traditional one. A few years later, women were marching through the streets of Copenhagen to protest against not having the vote and thus not being seen as human beings with the same value as men. The woman writer Tiet Jensen became one of the most trenchant advocates of women's rights and said many years later, We have been many in the women's movement. There have been many who have fought for the right to vote. And they have fought here straight for. And they came so easily at one time. I was high up in Jylland. And then there was a vote there. And I came to Sigel to see how it went. And there was a vote from the river, from the strand, from the fish and all that. Og var en stor plads, hvor der var telt op, og jeg hørte jo på de forskellige talere. Jeg tror, det var den eneste kvinde, der var kommet der. Og, og det burde jeg jo aldrig være kommet. For jeg har i mit liv aldrig set en sådan forsamling af fulde mænd. De var så fulde, at hele pladsen stank. Og så stod jeg og tænkte mig selv, alle de der, som går lige fulde alle sammen, de har ret til at gå der ind og stemme, men du har ikke. Og jeg er den eneste af dig. At this time, though, the love between Karl and Anne-Marie was only under a strain, not seriously threatened. On 27th December 1896, he wrote the final notes of a great hymn to love, Hymnus Amoris, a choral work where he had the different ages of life praising the power of love. Anne-Marie drew the front cover for the printed edition and Nielsen wrote in her copy, This music in praise of love is so little compared with the reality. But as long as you keep loving me, I will strive for a higher expression of the mightiest power in the world. And the two of us together will rise higher and higher towards the goal and all our striving will be love in life and in art. No less than twice, there are two pairs of words that are hard to reconcile. Life and art, striving and love. 
The relationship between these two artists, who were at the same time man and wife, was not least the story of how terribly difficult this balancing act turned out to be. And it is probably easier to sing in praise of love than to live it. Around this time, behind his wife's back, Carl Nielsen embarked on a string of sexual escapades and love affairs that continued for several years. In 1895, after the birth of Hans Boer, they were a family of five. Their daughter, Emmeline, had been born in 1891. Anne-Marie, nicknamed Sus, was born a couple of years later. And Carl Nielsen wrote coolly in his diary, it was not with joy we welcomed this child, for we had so wanted it to be a son. The artist's home was hospitable and always open to other artists. For example, painters like Joachim and Niels Skogko. Anne-Marie's close friend, Marie Müller, also came to the home and often took care of the children and even moved in as a governess when Anne-Marie was out on her travels. Later, she was to be the occasion of the greatest crisis in the marriage, when Anne-Marie found out that she and Karl had engaged in a long-lasting affair. For a period, Karl Nielsen lived on Anne-Marie's family's farm, Tugisminde, in South Jutland. In fact, at one point, he toyed with the idea of becoming a farmer, since he doubted whether he could make a living as a composer in the long term. But, as always, the level-headed Anne-Marie brought him to his senses. My own dearest love, you are good and wise and warm. You must tramp into Danish humanity. You must plough a deep furrow there, not at Tugisminde. Carl Nielsen took her at her word. In 1898, he got to grips with his most ambitious work so far, a grand choral opera based on the Old Testament story of Saul and David. A drama of power and fate, war and love, betrayal, strife and doubt. But in 1901, even before the opera was finished, he began working on his second symphony, The Four Temperaments. With the successes of both this and the opera, Carl Nielsen was already established as Denmark's most important composer. Some people even thought he was a match for the very greatest in musical history, and this created a minor musical-political feud. Let us repeat for the umpteenth time, wrote Politikon's dreaded critic Charles Kjerulf at the end of 1903. Carl Nielsen is the most important and surest talent in contemporary Danish music, but he has no right to the position that a small circle of foolish fire worshippers claim for him. They say without shame, Beethoven, Mozart, Carl Nielsen. And there is apparently one who says Beethoven, Carl Nielsen, Mozart. Carl Nielsen replied in a reader's letter, no one could find such a comparison more laughable than myself but to no avail. 
Yet there is plenty of evidence that Mozart did in fact preoccupy Nielsen again and again in the period of creative ferment around 1905 when he wrote his second opera, Masquerade. He felt a Mozart-like playful lightness in his work. Comedy by Ludwig Holberg formed the basis for the plot of the new opera, and in its own way, it became very Mozartian. The Holberg expert, Willem Andersen, wrote the libretto, and Masquerade quickly won a status as a kind of Danish national opera. In its very first season, it was played 20 times, still a unique record in the history of Danish opera. The tale of how the bourgeoisie is both attracted and repelled by the newfangled carnival custom mixes a clash of generations, a comedy of errors, eroticism, mystery and humour in a way that can be experienced both quite spontaneously and as a symbolic story about the magical power of music and its ability to make us all feel equal. But on the home front, Carl Nielsen was having difficulties. And as a wage earner in the Royal Orchestra, he felt neglected. Perhaps the bliss he felt in his creative work made him experience the world of reality as poor and empty. He had begun deputising as a conductor at the theatre, but was still being paid as a second violinist and felt he was surrounded by envy. Now, the Royal Theatre suddenly demanded that he return to be an ordinary musician, or a harmless private soldier, as he put it. At that institution, there isn't a single person with the ability or will to do anything, he wrote to a friend. In the autumn of 1904, his wife had travelled to Athens, where she was to work with classical sculptures for almost a year. He missed her, felt angry and powerless, and thought that neither she nor anyone else supported him. Those who envy and oppose me at the theatre have worked quietly to ensure that I've been dismissed, or rather have been forced to tender my resignation, he wrote to Anne-Marie in March the next year. And the letter ends with a question. Will you, with your capital and your income, undertake to take care of yourself and the children, and I will try to start all over again abroad. Or what do you think? He felt alone and betrayed. If only I could shout you back into healthy human surroundings, my dearest. I am so fond of you. You must come down from all that art nonsense and the situation was further aggravated. I don't have a single person I can wholly and sincerely rely on, he claims. In the midst of the work with the sparklingly funny first act of Masquerade, he suddenly threatens to seek a divorce. Dear Marie, it is heartbreaking to get such a letter as today's. Knowing that I have been dismissed, you write that I should travel down to Athens. I think you should come home right away. That is my last plea to you. I only ask that now we must get our divorce over with. I am in despair at having to tell you this. I am so endlessly fond of you, and it would be hard to do without the children. <laughs> <laughs> 
His cry of distress works. And Marie immediately sends a telegram, I don't want a divorce. And in a letter that she may not have sent, she writes, My head aches, my whole body is freezing. You must not tear my nerves raw. But no one will tear you away from me, for we belong together. Carl Nielsen returned to the Royal Theatre, but only to new plots and difficulties. The problems there, and in his marriage, seem to have dampened his creative spirit, and for a long period he mostly composed occasional and commissioned works. But then he gathered strength for a tour de force. The third symphony, Espansiva, was written in the years 1910 and 11, and it became the work that made Nielsen's name in earnest abroad. Characteristically enough, the beginning of the really big international breakthrough that his music has seen in recent decades came with Leonard Bernstein's performance and recording of Espansiva with the Royal Orchestra when he received the Sonning Prize in 1965. Or not, it is a good story that Carl Nielsen had two of his most famous ideas while standing on the back platform of the tram. The first subject of Espensiva and the melody of his song about the obscure life and death of Jens the Road Mender by the socially aware poet Jeppe Oker. <laughs> Oker wrote to him, I owe you my warmest thanks for the incomparable melody in which you have so gently wrapped my yens. The song became a real hit, and Carl Nielsen was to regret bitterly that he'd sold it once and for all for a mere 50 kroner. Espansiva took its name from its first movement with its immense drive, the expansive element. It begins with an amazingly original idea. A single note is repeated faster and faster as if a violent pressure gives birth to the theme, then almost throws it into space like a handful of stones. On 28 February 1912, the symphony was given its first performance, and instantly it became an overwhelming success. Carl Nielsen was at the peak of his career. But at home, the tense situation had worsened. Anne-Marie Carl Nielsen had won a competition for the gigantic task of creating an equestrian monument for King Christian IX. She was often on long trips abroad, and she had no idea that her husband had just acquired a new daughter. <laughs> 
problems with both work and love were gradually so drastically aggravated that they spilled out into Carl Nielsen's life and art. Although his abilities as a conductor were always controversial, in 1908, he'd become an assistant conductor at the Royal Theatre. When the principal conductor, Frederick Rung, died in February 1914, Nielsen counted on taking over his job. But the theatre wished to give the younger, talented George Herberg equal status. Outwardly, Carl Nielsen seemed in every way the exact opposite of Richard Wagner. But in fact, he admired many things in Wagner and looked forward to conducting the first Danish performance of Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. When this prestigious task was given to Heuberg, he promptly tendered his resignation. His wife, Anne-Marie, had now at long last discovered that her husband had repeatedly been unfaithful to her when she was away for long periods, and that he'd even fathered a daughter behind her back. The relationship between the two artists was plunged into a crisis that was to last many years, and which in reality meant that the couple only lived together pro forma in the spacious artist's residence on the Copenhagen harbour front, which had been put at Anne-Marie's disposal. For a period, Carl Nielsen had his postal address in a different part of the city. And for extended periods, he lived with hospitable friends, usually at the manor Fulsang on the southern island of Loland, or on the estate Damgo outside Fredericia in the Jutland. And Marie not only felt that she'd been living a lie, she also felt unforgivably betrayed by people she had trusted. Carl Nielsen's love affair with her friend of many years, Marie Müller, had been known to many of their common friends who had come to the house. She herself had suspected nothing. I feel constant pain, she writes to him, and shame, so that I do not think I can walk down the street, but must steal along in the shadows of the houses. There are no malevolent thoughts in my emotions, but nor are there in the birds, which shrinks from returning to its nest where alien human hands have touched eggs or young that belong to it. And she concludes, Dear Carl, I no longer belong beside you and have not belonged there since the hidden things began. The lies have demeaned us more than anything else. Carl Nielsen replies, it is a life not to be endured and the thought that I am baser than all other people weighs me to the ground every time I try to lift myself up to life and work. Will you not help me? I do not know what to say and do. For you, everything I say is only words and lies. I do not know how I can talk to you. One thing is certain, though, that I cannot live without you. In the midst of this untenable situation, Carl Nielsen writes to her in May 1914, I have an idea for a new work, which will express everything we understand by the urge to live or the expression of life. That is, everything that moves, everything that wants life, that cannot be called evil or good, high or low, large or small, but only that which is life or that which wants life. I must have a word or a short title that says this. 
shortly afterwards, at the end of June 1914, World War I was ushered in by the shots fired in Sarajevo. Carl Nielsen's world was no longer the same. The Danish people were spared any real hostilities, but the massacres at the front affected everyone. To an acquaintance, he wrote, this is so excessive and so meaningless that life seems to be worth nothing. National feeling has become a spiritual syphilis that's eaten up brains and is grinning out through empty eye holes in insane hatred. It is as if the whole world is falling apart. His 50th birthday in June 1915 was marked by many celebrations, but he was weighed down by both the political and the private chaos. What on earth are we to do to understand and love each other, all without doing evil and hurting each other, he writes to Anne-Marie. I see clearly that in the long run I cannot bear the things that burden me and that I have deserved. The word crisis actually means turning point. For Carl Nielsen, this difficult period in his life became a turning point in many respects, and the new symphony was to stand out clearly from its three predecessors. The emotional balance sheet no longer added up. Carl Nielsen's betrayal and Anne-Marie's sorrow could no longer be talked or composed away. In 1919, the couple separated at her request. They tried to keep up a facade, but behind that facade, their life together had in reality gone to pieces and the relations they now and then felt obliged to maintain led only to hopelessness, helplessness, or bitterness. And Marie was now, as before, often on long journeys. In Celle in northern Germany, for example, she made a plaster cast of the stallion Fliegart for use in one of her main works, the great equestrian monument to King Christian IX, on which she worked for a total of almost 21 years. Carl Nielsen felt more and more homeless 
and was more than ever dependent on his many hospitable and prosperous friends. In one of the very few films that exist of him, he can be seen some years later visiting one of the benefactors who supported him most generously, the successful businessman Carl Johann Michelsen and his family. During the war years, that Nilsson established his quite unique position in musical life as both a popular composer of songs and a full-blooded musical modernist. He himself was fully aware of this dual role, but he saw no discrepancy in it. The popular is a reality in every single human being, he wrote, an historical layer that can be made to resonate. In 1915, Collaborating with the great renewer of Danish sacred music, Thomas Laup, he published the songbook, A Score of Danish Songs. In May, the two composers invited the public to a Danish song evening and presented old, well-known verses with new melodies, including several songs that later became part of the soul of the Danish people. In the years after the Fourth Symphony, which is full of conflict, he composed a number of his most appealing, charming and beloved works. For example, the stage music for the play The Mother, with the final song Like a Fleet to Seaward Longing, and the imperishable The Fog is Lifting. He composed the colourful, orientalising stage music for the Danish national poet Adam Erlenschleyer's play Aladdin. And in 1921, he very quickly wrote a song cycle that he called a lyrical humoresque entitled Springtime on Funen. In it, all is bright, playful, and subtly humorous. And there is plenty of evidence that Carl Nielsen himself had a highly developed sense of humor. Here, many years later, his daughter Emilyn talks about it. He was very curious. He loved to laugh. If there was something he could mourn about, I can assure you that it happened with the same. He discovered that people were funny. Pussighed og lige med det samme. Og han kunne tale efter en vær og gå efter dem, og, og det var, kunne gøre det være helt farligt. <laughs> it is nothing less than amazing that the composer behind the cheerful, idyllic music of Springtime on Funen had just finished the first movement of one of his most rigorous experimental works, The Fifth Symphony. In it, Nielsen makes a clean break with the symphonic tradition. The work has only two movements, or rather two large parts. And from the beginning, the classical major minor tonality is sensed only as a shadow. <laughs> 
In no other work by Nielsen do the constructive and destructive forces in life clash with such violence, order and chaos, dream and discord, light and darkness. The first movement is dominated for a long time by calm and harmony, but then the harmony is disturbed quite physically and frighteningly. Again and again, an agitated motif in the woodwinds and strings tries to stifle the peaceful, balanced melody, backed up in the end by an inexorably beaten military snare drum. But the melody continues regardless. It grows in strength and gravity, and in the end, the disturbers of the peace retreat. contrast one finds in Nielsen's musical thinking, the simple, the popular versus the brooding and innovative, the security of childhood versus pain and doubt, may be reflected in a work where the fundamental antitheses of life are confronted with one another in two mighty movements. But the trial of strength between light and darkness ends unresolved. It was not a serene, contented Carl Nielsen who put the final touches to the Fifth Symphony after New Year 1922. His marriage was still on hold. The work had completely drained him of strength. His heart was giving him trouble. And in the course of the summer, he became seriously ill. The doctors forbade him any exertion, no compositions, and he was not even to read. But he was allowed to knit. To a colleague at the Academy of Music, he wrote, Perhaps your wife would like a duster. I'll make one for her. I can also crochet a red border. Around New Year 1922-23, though, things appear to have brightened up a little in the relationship between the couple. The wounds were not healed, but the intervening seven or eight years had matured them both, and Carl Nielsen's illness had again brought them closer to each other. Little by little, Anne-Marie and Carl resumed their full marital life in the artist's residence by the harbour. But Nielsen's heart problems had come to stay. He was suffering from angina pectoris, hardening of the coronary artery. The only cure available then was relaxation. But the restless Nielsen had little talent for that. In 1918, he had bought a summer residence in Skeyen, in the north of Jutland, attempting to create a neutral place where he and Anne-Marie could be together without painful memories of the past. It was there, in Skeyen, in 1924, that he got his first car, a Renault, which the local police constable taught him to drive in 15 lessons. This little, safe, honest, fine, sensitive, lively and yet even-tempered Renault, he called it fondly, and he became a keen motorist. But about a year before he died, he had an accident. He crashed into a tram and was quite seriously injured. <laughs> 
In the summer of 1924, he drove on his first long-distance tour from Skeyen to the estate Dumgor by the Little Belt. And there he began work on his sixth symphony, which was to be the most distinctive and self-assertive of all. Later, it was given the name Sinfonia Semplice, the simple symphony. With the fifth symphony, Carl Nielsen's music had become modern, but he himself would hardly have put it that way. The very word modern was odd, he thought. An anecdote, which may be true, says that Bela Bartok once asked Nielsen if he thought that he, Bartok, was modern enough. What Nielsen replied, we don't know, but he commented on it later. One should not go hunting for modernity. One should simply try to be oneself. Not too long ago, the works of the last years of Nielsen's life were viewed as signs of the infirmity of age. But today, very few people look at them this way. Nielsen simply doesn't fit in with the narrow, habitual notions of artistic identity. That a composer can write children's songs with such a broad appeal that they have become part of the Danish national identity and at the same time compose the labyrinthine experiment that is the sixth symphony. This is arguably unparalleled in the history of music. So the teasing title of the last symphony, Sinfonia Semplice, Simple Symphony, is not only enigmatic, it is directly provocative for it's the most horribly difficult to play of all Nielsen symphonies. It has often confused its listeners, and it is full of irony, self-irony, and knotty problems. He appears to have wanted to write a symphony of a quite idyllic character, as he wrote to his daughter Anne-Marie, but the result was by no means an idyll. The developmental form, the great musical drama which, as late as the Fifth Symphony, dominated the music at all levels, had now all at once disappeared. Perhaps the only simple thing about this symphony is that it has no sequential plot, drama or narrative. The Sixth Symphony became at once an ending and a new surprising beginning in Nielsen's life's work. Carl Nielsen sometimes enjoyed success abroad. In October 1926, for example, at a big concert in Paris with an all Nielsen program, and in July 1927, when the famous Wilhelm Furtwängler conducted his fifth symphony in Frankfurt. But he still felt like a minor figure on the European music scene, and he never experienced a true international breakthrough during his lifetime. When he turned 60, he was acclaimed at numerous concerts for months, but shocked the public by stating in a newspaper interview that he had sacrificed his talents to something quite unreal and should rather have trained in business or done some other useful work. Constantly to seek happiness, he said, and then only to be a success. <laughs> 
it's not the same thing. In 1931, Carl Nielsen accepted the position as director of the Royal Danish Academy of Music. It is said that an organ grinder came into the yard to play. Carl Nielsen opened the window and shouted down to him, play a little faster, which the man then did. Later, the street musician came back, this time with a little notice on his barrel organ saying, pupil of Carl Nielsen. But Nielsen was not to sit in the director's chair for long. His heart was now almost always giving him trouble, and he was often plagued by shortness of breath and pains. He was tired and weakened. And when we see the 66-year-old with a tennis racket and ball in a small fragment of film from the summer of 1931, it can only be to please the photographer. On the 3rd of October that year, he died at the University Hospital in Copenhagen with his family around him. His last words were, you're all standing as if you're waiting. The funeral was at the cathedral in Copenhagen and the church was crowded with people who had waited for hours to get in. He was buried on a gloomy autumn day at the Western Cemetery in Copenhagen, and Anne-Marie made a small speech. He was like an ever-playing fountain. He has never stood still, she said. After the burial, a barrel organ was heard playing outside the cemetery. It would probably have pleased Carl Nielsen, and who knows, Perhaps it was his pupil. <laughs> 